Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds today. Happy to have our speaker, Dr. Ned Carney. And I will turn it over to Dr. Beerkins to introduce him. Franz, you're up. I think you want very much. Give me one second. Hello, everybody. Today, we are welcoming Dr. Garish Nutkarni, the Fishburg Professor of Medicine here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is also the chief of the Division of Data-Driven and Digital Medicine, D3M, and the director of the Charles Bronfman Institute of Personalized Medicine. He received training in mathematics before completing his medical degree at one of the top-ranked medical colleges in India. He then received a master's in public health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, and then was a research associate at the Johns Hopkins Medical Institute. Dr. Nathkarni completed his residency in internal medicine and a clinical fellowship in nephrology here at Mount Sinai, then completed a research fellowship in personalized medicine here at Mount Sinai as well. Dr. Nakani has since authored over 300 peer-reviewed scientific publications, including ones in the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of Medi American Medical Association, JAMA. He has received many awards, including the Best Outgoing Senior Resident, Dr. Harold and Golden Lampert Research Award, the ANIO Rising Star Award, and the Deal of the Year Award at Sinai Innovations. He is the principal for several NIH-funded grants, and is the scientific co-founder of several investor-backed companies. We are incredibly lucky to have him. Please join us in welcoming him here today. Thank you for the kind introduction. That's what happens when you write your introduction yourself, so uh, you're kind to yourself. <laughs> but thank you. It's very kind. Um, so uh, good morning, everyone. And um, uh, today I'm going to uh, speak about an uh, exciting new program at Mount Sinai, called as a Mount Sinai Million Health Discoveries Program. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, let me tell you how excited and how honored I am to be one of the Grand Round speakers. It's uh, truly uh, a great department of medicine, and uh, uh, under the leadership of now Monica, uh, I think we, we're going to reach greater heights. As, and uh, uh, I hope to play a part in that, especially with my uh, role in the Mount Sinai Million Health Discoveries Program. So before we start, I just want to give you a little bit of history on how this program came about. So I'm going to structure this talk into four big sections, right? So I'm going to give you an introduction to physician medicine, personalized medicine, individualized medicine, pick your own word for it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Biome Biobank, which was the predecessor uh, to the Mount Sinai Million. Then, you know, I'm going to talk about two sort of real examples of precision medicine in diverse populations and uh, 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 try to make a case about how um, we can engender precision medicine, especially in diverse communities to ensure health equity. And then finally, I'm going to briefly discuss the, Mount, the new program that uh, has started at Mount Sinai called as the Mount Sinai Million Health Discoveries Program. Stop me at any time for questions, comments, uh, so, so I think over the last few years, medicine is moving from a one size fits all approach or empirical medicine where, you know, there's one treatment for all. Obviously, the treatments are mostly evidence based, mostly um, based upon clinical trials um, to personalized medicine in which there are in maybe individual treatments for each patient and uh, they are evidence-based as well. I don't think we are quite there yet. Uh, maybe we are there somewhere in the middle, which is what's, uh, like, uh, what is called a stratified medicine, where uh, instead of uh, truly individualized medicine per patient, you have different groups, you know, you can take a large population of patients, divide them into individual subgroups based upon genomics or biomarkers and have different treatments for each group. Now, the central hypothesis of precision medicine, and again, you know, precision medicine is a term that is uh, interchangeable with personalized medicine, individualized medicine, pick your own phrase for it, whatever you like. Uh, the central hypothesis is uh, in this view is that 
you have an individual person, you can have a lot of data about that person, be it genetic and non-genetic. And based upon this large amount of data, you could personalize each treatment uh, to the patient based upon their individual combination of genomic and environmental and other characteristics. So a couple of points I want to make on this slide. The first point is that I think uh, when we talk about precision medicine or personalized medicine, we predominantly talk about genetics, but I think it's beyond genetics because genetics is a core integral component of it. And I'm going to talk about that today, but I think it's beyond that because there's a in this age of digitization, we collect a lot of information about each individual person, be it patients or citizens, and all of that information could be used um, to make decisions about the medical care of the patient, be it improving diagnosis, prognosis, or treatment. And this is sort of making that point again, is that you know human beings are complex, right? Um, human diseases are complex. Um, the world we live in is quite complex. So representing any uh, a complex clinical condition and uh, outcome based upon one individual uh, single modality is is hard to hard to do, right? For example, um, you have your book of life, your genomic architecture, but then you know you, that interacts with your environment, um, interacts with the world of exposures, uh, both the. Uh, 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 environmental and other exposures, and that leads to uh, disease or health in that case. Um, so uh, what this figure is trying to show is all of those can be taken as inputs, can be put into sort of advanced analytical systems. And again, um, I'm, this is, talk is not about artificial intelligence, but you know, uh, AI and machine learning can be used as methods in order to integrate all of these diverse inputs together. And the output would be either better I, uh, better diagnosis of patients, better prognosis of patients, or a better treatment of patients and finding new treatments or uh, defining what particular treatment for each individual patient. So the case I'm making today is achieving equitable precision medicine requires that we take all of the data that's available on each individual patient to us, we intelligently combine them together, and then we use all of this uh, sort of combined harmonized data in order to understand health and disease. Now, again, I'm predominantly going to be talking about genomics today, but genomics is one data type that needs to be fused with a variety of other data types in order to actually achieve clinical change. And genomics is, is very important, right? Because uh, there's been a huge focus on it for the last... I don't know, 22 years since the human genome was sequenced. So this slide on the left shows the cost per genome of uh, sequencing. When the human genome was sequenced in 2001, the cost was, I don't know, a billion dollars. But now in 2021, the cost has fallen to a thousand dollars. And recently in uh, Illumina, uh, the Illumina Health Expo, whatever they call it, um, a new machine got introduced, which could further drop that cost, I think, down to as low as $150 or $200. And there have been some successes, um, and obviously this is not an exhaustive list of successes, but there have been some successes throughout the uh, life cycle from susceptibility, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. Uh, for example, uh, HCV, um, uh, a sequencing led, led to uh, good uh, markers for HC viral load and viral genotype and treatment based upon um, individual uh, genotypes or viral loads, similarly for HIV and similarly for breast cancer. But again, uh, 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 compared to, and I'll say this with a straight face, but compared to that the fact that genomics was supposed to revolutionize medicine, that hasn't really happened. And the, 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 one of the issues is there's, uh, if you think about genomics or genetics from uh, a, uh, 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 with uh, 
as a, as a marker of effect size versus frequency, right? So on this axis is the effect size. That means if you have this particular genetic uh, variation, it increases the risk of disease. And on this axis, you have how frequent this particular marker is. Um, there are most of the markers that we find are very common, but they have very, very low effect size. There are some markers like Mendel for Mendelian disease, which are rare, extremely rare, obviously, because they have been weeded out by selection, but cause a very high effect size and a high risk of disease. On this side, there are very, very few markers or few genetic variations that are common enough, uh, but have high effect size that can actually make a substantial uh, 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 contribution to disease pathogenesis in any large population. And I'm gonna talk about two of them. And you know, no one really cares about these because these are rare and small effect size and they are very hard to identify by any genetic means. And another way to think about genomics or genetics is sort of monogenic versus polygenic variation, right? So um, uh, monogenic variation are, there are some uh, rare but highly penetrated variation uh, in single genes that confer increased risk, right? So if you think about the previous slide, um, the ones that have uh, low frequency, but high effect size. But now what polygenicity is actually, I think, underlying most of the genomic diseases, right? Um, but, uh, or most of the common complex diseases. So polygenic risk is basically, if you take all of the small effect size and frequent markers, and then you add them up, right? Every patient will be on a, a, a distribution scale. Um, so uh, 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 most people will have uh, 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 most people will be in the middle, but there'll be some people at the tails of this distribution that have inherited all of the uh, uh, mutations that increase risk. So in that case, they will basically uh, be the equivalent of a monogenic mutation, but they'll be much higher frequency than a monogenic mutation. Sorry. But the other big problem is genomics is failing on diversity. Um, so there's a huge uh, risk of there's a huge historical lack of diversity in large scale genomic studies. So I think 80% of all of the genomic studies that have been done till date have been done in Europeans and only around two or percent in Africans, 10% in Asians. Um, so less than 20, you know, a quarter of genomic studies have been done in racial and ethnic diversity populations. And um, Imar Kenny um, and Alicia Martin from Hopkins um, basically showed that this just doesn't affect uh, single or monogenic mutation, it affects polygenicity as well. So if you use Europeans as a reference populations, uh, if you try to derive polygenic scores from Europeans and transfer them to African-Americans or other Europeans, they don't really work as well. The prediction accuracy significantly drops. For example, in African-Americans, the prediction accuracy is only 25% compared to the level of Europeans. So, if we are going towards a world of precision medicine where uh, uh, we need to achieve equitable precision medicine, I do think that this is a glaring, glaring issue that needs to be addressed, especially increasing the number of uh, diverse populations in genomic studies. Otherwise, you know, think about a world where we start using this test in common practice and the prediction accuracy is significantly lower for one group, right? And uh, when you've seen this before in the cases case of clinical tests like EGFR or uh, pulse oximetry, right? Now we will just be perpetuating this problem to more advanced tests. Any questions at this point of time? No. All right. So now that I have had that long winded introduction, I'm going to talk about the Biome Biobank. So I'd like to make this case to you that biobanks are the foundation of personalized medicine. So what is a biobank, right? So um, you basically um, enroll a large number of patients 
from a health system or from multiple health systems across the country or from um, uh, a community in, uh, into and you bank specimens on them. Now, the specimens mostly are DNA, could be plasma, could be um, other biological specimens like urine, et cetera, et cetera. You link them um, uh, with clinical data. And again, as uh, um, um, uh, uh, again, as medicine is becoming more and more digitized and electronic health records are becoming more and more prevalent, uh, there's ample opportunity to study individuals across the lifespan. So if it's quite powerful because if you have the genomics and or other biomarkers on one hand and you've linked them to longitudinal clinical records on the other side then you can essentially uh, make uh, discoveries and inferences across the health uh, across the healthcare journey of individual patients and biobanks are very useful because they can be used in several different ways and i've just put down four illustrative ways in which biobanks could be used so first is the association of genes with phenotypes. Obviously, that's an easy one. So uh, um, uh, genomic studies are growing larger and larger and more and more genes that get associated with phenotypes get discovered. The second is a more exciting one in which you can find rare genes or protective genes that protect you against one particular disease. And that becomes a foundation for new medication discovery. A good example here is the PCSK9 uh, gene uh, uh, mutation in the PCSK9 gene was found to decrease cholesterol. Uh, people made a medication mimicking it, and now that medication is FDA approved in the market for cholesterol. Um, but you can also uh, identify patients who have known disease-causing genes, and you can return those results to those patients. And uh, the Institute of Genomic Health, led by Imar Kenny, is doing a significant proportion of this work at Mount Sinai. Um, and then um, you can find subpopulations of defined genotype and phenotype, and you can uh, 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 and you can enroll them into trials because clinical trials are sort of hard to do, and a lot of them fail on uh, enrollment. So if you have a defined population which already has genomics uh, 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 information available then you could take that part of the population and enroll them into clinical trials. So I'm going to give you examples from my own work of a couple of these use cases of biobanks. So if you think about Mount Sinai, we are in a pretty interesting position uh, geographically, right? So Mount Sinai Hospital sits right here um, uh, at the intersection of Central Harlem, which is predominantly African-American, not Black. East Harlem, which is predominantly Hispanic, and Upper East Side, which is predominantly white. And that actually gives us a pretty interesting uh, uh, demographic split within our health system, or sorry, within our main hospital and across our health system, actually. And if potentially you could enroll these people into a biobank, it would be one of the most diverse biobanks in the world. And that's actually what happened, right? So when the Miami Biobank started in 2007, um, uh, uh, it uh, and it was started by my mentor, Erwin Bottinger, who's now in Germany, but also part-time at, uh, uh, at Mount Sinai. So this graph is uh, basically shows all most of the biobanks in the world. Um, and this axis is when the year enrollment started. And this is the proportion of non-European ancestry participants, which is sort of a metric for diversity. So, but Biomi Biobank is... Uh, started in around 2007, but has around 70% participants, which are from diverse ancestries, mostly African-American and Hispanic Latino. Um, and it's uh, apart from biobanks in China, which obviously have 100% participants with a lot of European ancestry, it's one of the most diverse biobanks in the world. And it's a very powerful tool for novel discovery and uh, clinical translation in very diverse populations. So as I was mentioning with about the biobank, uh, it's linked to electronic health records. So it's a, it's a powerful tool for discovery because you have the genomic information on one side and you have the longitudinal clinical information on the other side. So you can make discoveries across the health uh, care journey of each individual patient. 
we have a broad consent in place for research and recontact in which case uh, you can actually suppose you have an interesting gene that you want to study or you have an interesting phenotype that you want to study you can actually call back these patients for research and uh, you can recontact these patients and call them back in for further studies and um, uh, because we have uh, 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 ongoing relationship with these patients the recontact and reconsent rate is close to like 60% and there's a uh, detailed question and data uh, including data on diet exercise and other lifestyle and finally um, there's genotyping and exome sequencing data so around 50000 people have genotyping and exome sequencing data this population is also extremely diverse 65% of patients or participants have more than 3 gra grandparents born outside the us um again uh, uh, uh highlighting how uh, uh, it's one of the most diverse biobanks in the world all right any questions till now so in uh in the next couple of parts of the talk i'm going to give you two examples of precision medicine from my own work in diverse populations so again you know we used the biome data for this particular uh, for these two examples and i'm mostly going to talk about the association of genetics with phenotypes and identification of known disease causing genes so now um, i'm a nephrologist um so i specialize in kidney disease but you know the uh, this is one of the best examples in the world of how infectious disease and kidney disease sort of interact right um so sleeping sickness or trypanosomiasis in africa is endemic in sub saharan africa so the vector is a such sea fly it infects um uh, uh, a trypanosome called st brucei into the circulation um the brucei can uh, 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 the trypanosome can stay dormant for many many years but also infects the brain and causes cns damage and you know causes uh, coma that's why it's called a sleeping sickness and then it you know uh, the human another fly can bite the human and the cycle continues again now why is it important right it's important because this trypanosome has led to one of the biggest uh, disease causing mutations evolution in the last i don't know many 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 years right so uh, this is a recombination map if you look at apol1 there's a very sharp spike here which is called a recombination hotspot that basically means that um this mutation has arisen only in the last 10000 years which is decent compared to human history so what actually happens right so um trypanosoma uh, uh this is a trypanosome um if you have the ancestral or the wild type apol1 it binds to hdl the hdl uh, enters the trypanosome enters its lysosome the lys it causes lysosomal swelling and the parasite dies but parasites are smart right they evolve um knowing that human beings had this particular defense para the trypanosoma brucei evolved into the trypanosoma rodentiae which basically developed this blocking factor called as a serum receptor activator the sra that blocks the this complex with apol1 uh, the ancestral form of apol1 does not enter let it enter the lysosome and the parasite survives but human beings are also smart so they we basically evolved a variant of the apol1 gene which evades this uh, sra lets uh, uh, the complex of hdl and apol1 into the paras into the lysosome and the lysosome swells and the parasite dies now the result of this what has happened is in areas where trypanosomes are prevalent the number of patients or the number of sorry people with um a G, very with apol1 mutations have arisen to a very high number right um so uh, sub saharan africa this kind of maps to where trypanosomes are prevalent there's quite a lot of migration so if you look at this part um there are uh, in the west of sub saharan africa apol1 g1 and g2 which are the mutated forms of apol1 are almost to like 50 60% frequency 
Now, why does it matter uh, to us? So this matters to us because there were persistent racial and ethnic disparities in kidney disease. Um, so this is a USRDS graph, which basically shows the number of patients every year who require dialysis or a transplant because of uh, kidney disease and uh, because of end-stage kidney disease. And you can see that African-Americans have approximately two to two and a half times the rates of requiring dialysis or transplant as compared to Caucasians. Now, obviously, uh, it's um, it's a multi. The reasons for disparities are very multifactorial, involving the environment, uh, issues with uh, healthcare access uh, and care delivery. But biology also plays an important part, and it plays an important part, particularly in kidney disease in racial and ethnic minorities. And the intense search of uh, for uh, um, uh, what by what genetics is actually driving these disparities actually was uh, led to one of the most seminal discoveries in my field uh, in, by Martin Pollack from uh, Beth Israel Deaconess, who showed that uh, um, uh, uh, APOL1, um, the two mutations were in on chromosome 22 were actually associated strongly with a, odds of end-stage kidney disease. And they are very common in African chromosomes, but almost absent from European chromosomes. So these two mutations are on chromosome 22. Uh, this is the three dash end, this is the five dash end. So the two mutations basically are um, called as G1 and G2. Fun fact, they're called as G1 and G2 because the first author who discovered them, his name is Guglio Genovese, G and G. Um, so if you discover in genetics, you can name it after yourself. It's like a star. Um, uh, so G1 is two missense variants in linkage disequilibrium. That means that only one of them occurs in one individual patient. Its frequency is 22% in African ancestry participants. And G2 is a six base pair deletion. So six base pairs actually deleted. Its frequency is 13% in African ancestry. And the risk genotype, that means you need this mutation on both sides of the chrome, on both chromosomes is either the G1, G1, G2, G2, or G1, G2. And it's this is one of the most frequent um, uh, mutations in like racial and ethnic minorities. And it occurs in approximately 14 to 16% of African-Americans. Um, and uh, if you look, if you think back to the slide I showed you with the effect size and the frequency, this is one of the very, very rare mutations where the effect size is high and the frequency is high. So then there was another seminal paper by Afshin Parsa in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, which actually showed that if you had two copies of the APOL1 risk variants, you are at significantly higher risk uh, of progressing on to kidney failure. And estimates are showed that if you have zero or one risk copy, your lifetime risk of kidney failure is around 2%. But if you have two risk copies, your lifetime risk of kidney failure is around 10%. So a five-fold increase risk. And since then, there have been a number of papers out on um, APOL1 and kidney disease disparities. Um, so it affects individuals literally across the lifespan. Um, so uh, this is one of my favorite graphs from Rulan Parekh, uh, uh, one of the nephrologists in Canada. It shows the age in years and the risk as an odds ratio or a relative risk. So it's been linked with preeclampsia, it's been linked with hypertension, it's been linked with end-stage renal disease. In fact, uh, it's strongly linked with uh, uh, FSGS, in a, or, which is a form of uh, glomerulopathy in HIV. So if you, in HIV, if you don't have uh, APOL1 risk, it's almost impossible to get uh, high van. Um, so this is one of the, again, one of the very rare, rare variations, which basically, is affects health and disease across the whole lifespan is common 14 to 16 percent and confers reasonably high risk of disease all right so as i said this is one of the rare examples of high effect common variations that influence common disease all right so i want to talk, talk a bit about my own research and how we use biome for novel discovery and translation 
First, using Biome data, we actually showed in the uh, NHGM in 2018 that individuals who do not self-identify as African American or Black actually still have high rates of APOL1. So um, the coloring actually shows the proportion of APOL1. So light or light purple and dark purple um, actually shows uh, uh, is. 5 to 10 percent of the APO, of apol1 risk and more than 10 percent of the apol1 risk so individual who identified hispanics but come from the caribbean islands like say barbados or grenada or uh, panama actually have 5 to 10 percent of apol1 risk now this is very important because if you were to run a population screening program uh, and you just were to go on self-identified or EHR-based, which are the worst labels of being Black or African-American, you would miss a significant proportion of these people. So uh, 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 this would not have been possible without a diverse biobank. The second thing that we showed is we wanted to explore the incomplete penetrance of APOL1 and why is APOL1 not 100% penetrant. So it obviously confers a high risk of kidney disease, but it's not 100%. So uh, around 50% of people never develop kidney disease during their lifetime, right? So what's happening there? And again, genotype and environment sort of contribute to phenotype. And one of the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest non-traditional risk factors for complex disease is air pollution. Um, so this was a paper from uh, Ziad Al Ali from WashU, which basically showed that uh, air pollution increases risk of kidney disease pretty significantly. So for every 10 microgram per meter cube increase in PM 2.5, the risk of kidney disease in this case, end stage kidney disease goes up by 26%. So we wanted to look whether a air pollution was a significant in, interact with APOL1 or genetic risk in order to increase the risk of kidney disease. So uh, 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 I work with Alan Just from the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health. He has this very cool method of mapping air pollution uh, in small geographical areas. So what he does is he takes satellite images and uses the aerosol optical depth and combines machine learning and you can get to air pollution changes in very in small geographical areas. So this is an example of his work from Mexico City, which actually uh, shows the mean PM 2.5. PM 2.5 is particulate matter less than 2.5 microns. It's a well-established metric of air pollution in Mexico City. And on the right side, it's daily max uh, 2.5. And if you see this high um, levels in the center, that's because the central part of the city is most sort of, um, uh, has the most traffic and the most uh, um, uh, vehicular uh, exhaust in the day because of the financial center of the city. So we applied the same technique in Biome and we found that there was significant variation in air pollution in residential areas of Biome participants. So our central question was, was whether this variation in air pollution actually interacts with APOL1 risk for kidney disease. And we did find that. So we uh, uh, used the Biome data set and we conducted a logistic regression, adjusted for age, sex, insurance status, et cetera, et cetera. And we found that if you had a higher exposure of air pollution, then it increased risk in both APOL1 high risk and APOL1 low risk. But the slope or the uh, uh, in APOL1 high risk was much steeper. So it basically means that if you have APOL1 high risk, you can be worse off uh, uh, with environmental impacts for kidney disease opposed to if you have APOL1 low risk. Now, this is a single center study. It needs to be validated. So we are working with several large national cohorts to validate it. But this was the first time that uh, in kidney disease that people have shown that genetic risk and environmental risk interacts for worse outcomes. But now we need to give this information back to uh, uh, physicians and participants. And um, under the leadership of Carol Horowitz, we actually ran this clinical trial enrolling patients age 18 to 65 who were African, who had hypertension, did not have CKD. We randomized them to uh, uh, 
We did a seven to one patient randomization where we randomized 1800 to immediate APOL1 testing and 250 to delayed genetic testing. The primary endpoint was a difference in systolic blood pressure between APOL1 versus non APOL1 uh, 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 and the delayed testing groups and whether they got more uh, kidney disease screenings. And second endpoints were patient and provider surveys. So eligible patients were screened. Um, you gave them either immediate APOL1 testing and return of results with clinical decision support, or you delayed the APOL1 testing by a year, gave them other testing at the end, you followed them up for three months and then 12 months. And the results were embedded into the electronic health record. So the patients and providers could actually see them. Um, um, so this was what our example result looked like. Uh, and uh, yeah, there was there's some evidence to show a good blood pressure control and renal function testing may post all kidney failure. And then we gave the last three results of the, the last three blood pressure results of the patients. So the trial was partly positive, right? Um, at three months, the, you know, the controls dropped their blood pressure by three milligrams of mercury. The lowest genotypes dropped their blood pressure by three milligrams of mercury, but the highest genotypes dropped their blood pressure by six milligrams of mercury, which is almost twice that of the low risk as well as the controls. This is pretty significant. And the, the uh, 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 p-value for changeover group was also significant. The other co-primary outcome, uh, there was no real, there was a slight increase in testing of kidney function over time, but it wasn't really statistically significant. So based upon this, we are running a much larger trial nationwide called the GARD US study, again led by Carol, that uh, uh, is testing this out in twice the number of participants. And more, I think this is the most important part of the trial for me, is that patients actually had positive changes in their lifestyle and medication after returning results. So they made, you know, around 59% of them, people who had APOL1 high risk and had results returned to them, made uh, positive lifestyle changes, change how they take medication, take the blood pressure medication more often. So, in, and most patient responses were pretty uh, positive to return to getting the APOL1 results back. Uh, this is actual patient uh, records, uh, actual patient uh, transcripts, and uh, it the feeling was of hope and trying to take care of your own health as opposed to a sense of nihilism or despair about genetic results. So I think th this is pretty good supportive evidence that people would like to get their genetic results back. So in summary, uh, APOL1 risk is common and it confers high risk in diverse populations. Uh, the prevalence of APOL1 risk might be modified by environmental exposures, and returning APOL1 results to patients and providers results in changes in blood pressure and lifestyle. All right, so now my second favorite organ, the heart. Um, so uh, one of the other genetic diseases I study, and it was discovered in Mount Sinai, is the transthyretin. So transthyretin is formed in the liver, it breaks apart, but if you have this variation called TTR1V122I, it actually clumps and forms amyloid fibrils, and this deposit in the heart, the nerves, the uh, uh, joints, etc. The most common genetic cause is TTR V122I. It occurs in three to four percent of African Americans. Now, until two or three years back, uh, there were no really options, good options for treating HTTR, right? But now there's at least three or four FDA-approved medications, including inotercin. Patisiran and Tafamidis. And Tafamidis showed a significant improvement in survival and cardiovascular related hospitalizations. So, again, we use data from Biome to try to answer three of these questions, right? What's the prevalence of V122I in other diverse populations? Is V122I associated with early signs of heart failure? And is V122I tested for and diagnosed appropriately? So it's actually pretty prevalent in Afri patients similar to APOL1 who do not say that they are African-American or Black, right? So uh, in if it's 3 to 4% in people who self-identify as African-American or Black, it's actually 1% to 2% Hispanic Latino individuals, again, from the Afro-Caribbean belt. Um, so uh, uh, my point being that 
if you just uh, identify people based upon either self reported race or ehr based race you are going to miss a bunch of these people again and that will lead to persistent inequities in medicine again and this work was done with uh, uh rondo from the institute of personalized medicine then we joined forces with another biobank in the country called the pen medicine biobank uh, led by dan rader and scott ambrower so the pen medicine biobank uh, actually enrolls patients from throughout the pen healthcare system uh, it's very it's a very similar structure to the biomi biobank you know 50 2000 people patient participants are enrolled and uh, a significant proportion of them identifies having african ancestry so so the first result that we had from two independent studies was that uh, this particular genetic mutation is strongly associated with uh, heart failure in two independent cohorts so um, this was the nomenclature the jama made us use the cross sectional cohort was space pen medicine biobank the case control study was biomi biobank but regardless in two independent studies uh, 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 the carrier status was strongly associated with heart failure even after adjusting for hypertension or mi or cad but, and they made us bury this in like e table 11 of the appendix uh, because they didn't think it was important but i actually think it's pretty important is that in patients who are younger uh, less than 45 years of age without heart failure there was a string a strong association of this v122 i variant with left ventricular hypertrophy and i'm putting up left ventricular hypertrophy here but there were several other subclinical cardiovascular traits that this patients uh, exhibited these patients remember did not have heart failure were very young and still exhibited subclinical cardiovascular heart failure traits with this v122i variant so that gives us an opportunity for earlier intervention in this patient sort of if we knew the genetics earlier and this was especially shocking to me so we did a pretty uh, comprehensive chart review of all of the carriers especially the ones with heart failure and only 10 were diagnosed with amyloid either by a biopsy or by a pyp scan or by genetic testing 92 remain undiagnosed and most of the diagnosis here was said to be non ischemic heart failure the median time from onset of symptoms to genetic diagnosis was 3 years so again a huge opportunity to make a difference if we had genomic information on this patients so based upon this and many other studies the acmg actually the american college of medical genetics actually added um uh hv122i to its list of actionable variations so basically if you find them during gen- uh, clinical uh, uh, or research you have to return them to patients and the reason that acmg added them is because they agreed that there was enough evidence um um to say that if you return this results to patients there might be an appreciable change in clinical care so in summary um V122i carriers, which is predominantly found in uh, diverse populations, had prevalent heart failure and left ventricular hypertrophy even at younger ages and without diagnosis of heart failure. There was a huge delay in diagnosis at three years uh, and under diagnosis from its onset of symptoms. And ACMG added T- uh, TTR V122i to its actionable list. All right. so now back to the topic of my uh, talk and i'm going to be brief here because this is just starting is the mount sinai health discoveries program so again my central thesis is that uh uh, uh if we have more genetic and non genetic data for an individual patient we can lead we can decide improve optimal uh, diagnosis prognosis and treatment and a lot of resources have been put into reaching this goal right so what has been done right now there have been local programs for example biomi um uh, uh, pen medicine biobank the other example i gave geisinger biggest around 250000 national programs are like all of us uk biobank million veterans program there's commonly huge re- issues there right? there's a huge lack of diversity which i've shown in previous slides uh uh there's um data is not 
often available to the public. All of us is changing that significantly because they're making data available to everyone. Illness is underrepresented. For example, in the UK Biobank, um, because it was a lot of community engagement, the proportion of patients with serious illness was significantly lower than you would expect in a health system. And recruitment occasionally stalls because, you know, uh, like uh, there's significant logistical barriers to overcome. So uh, a big remaining gap that we don't know about is for a single health system, is a precision medicine approach better than the overall standard of care? And that's what we're trying to answer because, again, achieving equitable precision medicine requires combining data to understand health and disease. But just speaking for the Mount Sinai health system, genetic data is very, very underrepresented as opposed to other data types. For example, we have electronic health record data and imaging data and EKG data on like 14 million Sinai patients. We have genomic data on less than 100,000. So there's a huge disconnect there that we are trying to bridge. And the way we are trying to bridge it is use uh, is the program called the Mount Sinai Million Health Discoveries Program led by Alex Shani. The objective is to rapidly recruit, sample, and genetically profile 1 million diverse Mount Sinai Health System patients. And the outcome would be the Mount Sinai Clinical Genomic Database, which would be one of the largest efforts of its kind, not just in the country, but probably the world, um, and all at a single health system. So the question is, why are we doing this, right? Uh, and the reason that we are doing this is, in my mind, and there might, there might, there's probably other reasons, is fourfold, right? You, you can have populations never studied before at this scale in a single health system in a, a very, very diverse population. You're probably going to have actionable information for subsets of patients, like, you know, 14% of uh, all Black African-American patients will have APOL1. Significant proportion of them will have TTI variation, just two examples I showed you. We can actually do real-world deployment of models combining all of this data to um, choose potentially um, the best treatment for each individual patient. And so instead of just talking about precision medicine or personalized medicine, we can actually make it a reality. And this will be a resource that Mount Sinai investigators, clinicians, and faculty can build on for years and years to come. So uh, what could we do with a million Mount Sinai patients with integrated data? We could combine electronic health record and EHR to sort of generate, uh, to generate rapid insights. We could use them to develop clinical solutions, be it predictive models, clinical tools, diagnostic models. And we could essentially integrate them into workflow after appropriate testing, and then not just use them and deploy them at Mount Sinai Health System, but deploy them across the country and perhaps across the world, right? And we are going to be partnering with Rich and Ron Genetic Center, which is essentially one of the biggest uh, genetic sequencing facilities in the world. Um, uh, and they are going to be doing whole exome sequencing and SNP uh, uh, or genotyping on all of the million participants. The contract has been signed. You know, it's one of their largest collaborations in the world. They are very, very excited about this. And what do we get back? So we basically get back exome sequencing data plus the microarray. And we can link it to clinical data, all real world data obtained from routine clinical care. And most importantly, because a lot of us are clinicians and we care about how it impacts patient lives, two to three percent of patients with exome sequencing have actionable variation. This is a nature paper from UK Biobank, which showed that around two percent of patients who are exome sequenced in the UK Biobank have a medically actionable variant. Now, the UK Biobank, as I mentioned earlier, is a community-based cohort, so it's possible, and we've looked at this, that patients from Mount Sinai who are enriched, uh, who have a higher disease burden than the, uh, than the reasonably healthy population of UK Biobank will have a much higher proportion of actionable variation. So we anticipate it to be around 5%, uh, probably higher. And also remember that... Uh, ACMG will continue adding more and more actionable variation to its list. And internally at Mount Sinai, based upon clinician decision and feedback, we can make the decision of returning more results to them. 
So I think this is going back to what I was saying in the uh, is that we can Im immediately improve care in subsets of patients. So how do we plan to obtain DNA from 1 million patients? We want to leverage the clinical workflow. So traditionally, cohort studies usually got the sample at time of consent. We will plan, we plan to use clinical discards uh, because uh, clinical discards are thrown away after a period of time. But if you can get consent from the participant, you can use a clinical discard and that actually helps us scale because you can get consent from participants at home over my chart on my Mount Sinai over the phone without having them to, without requiring them to give a sample at a particular period of time. So the math kind of checks out, right? In 2019, 534,000 patients on Mount Sinai had a blood draw. In 2021, uh, 340,000 patients. So 876 unique patients have had a blood draw in two years, um, excluding the pandemic because it was a pandemic year. And Mount Sinai patients will be extremely diverse. I'm just giving you the uh, uh, breakdown of patients in 2021 in at Mount Sinai, where uh, you know approximately again to uh, uh, half or more than half belong to uh, 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 diverse populations, um, and this will be one of the most diverse. Um, resources in the world for genetic discovery and translation. So, in summary, we you know in Mount with Mount Sinai million, we can immediately improve care in thirty thousand patients by returning genetic results, which will grow over time. We will develop clinically actionable predictive and prognostic tools never before seen, uh, improving outcomes, and we'll ensure equity in both translational research and next generation of clinical care, and potentially make Mount Sinai one of the leading institutions worldwide for precision medicine. Now, we honestly need help with this, right? Because we are clinicians and we see patients, we need uh, all of us to be evangelists and tell our patients how important this is so that people participate. And I think the success or failure of this program depends upon clinicians because we have the strongest relationship with patients and patients trust us on this. So I'm, I'm, I, you know, in addition to sort of giving this talk, I'm also asking for help from the larger Mount Sinai medicine community to help us with this project. Again, um, thank you. I'm again very honored to be here and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Dr. Nakhar, that was great. There is a question in the chat, Arish. Um, I can read it for you. Can you comment about access to available BioMe data via gene genotype sequencing and disease browser? Yes. So we are planning to make the existing BioMe data completely available through what's called the Data Act Initiative from with Patricia Kovach and Scientific Computing, where all of the data at Mount Sinai is put into sort of a central data commons, and you can. Um, uh, anyone can get access to it. This will happen in the next six months. Bigger clarification. Is the new effort going to focus on specific diseases, diseases or on random enrollments? No, not on specific diseases. It's going to be opportunistic and focus on everyone that we can get because mm -hmm. to reach a population of 1 million Mount Sinai patients, we have to enroll one out of every 10 of Mount Sinai patients. Gotcha. Another question from Dr. Kraft. How will you how to go? How will you take into account gene by environmental interactions? Yeah. Uh, so gene I'll, I'll yeah. just add to that because you said you, you made a really good point saying that it's genes are key, but it's this uh, it's this interaction that actually can produce a phenotype of disease. And so I would guess you might be able to call some patients back and maybe do geospatial mapping or do some more in-depth studies around environment, unless you're planning on something else. No, so that's a really good question, Monica. So I'll, I'll try to answer that in two parts. So we don't need to call patients back for geospatial mapping, at least for Biome. We have the addresses and I, IRB gives us permission to actually do geospatial mapping on their home addresses. So you can use that for the pollution mapping that I talked about briefly. And this might be of interest to you specifically. Uh, the second thing is we have actually call patients back and, you know, every patient at Mount Sinai, uh, 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 Biobank as well as Mount Sinai Million gives permission to be contacted based upon genotype or phenotype and brought back in for further mechanistic or other studies, right? So uh, uh, it's been formalized in the in uh, 
uh, IPM under the Precision Clinical Research Unit. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so we can call that back in and get, you know, blood samples where you can look at epigenetic marks and things like that. So that's one, there's two ways of doing that. Uh, one is with the available data, but the second way is calling patients back and actually doing studies. And that. But I'd like to make one point is that gene environmental interaction. The most important thing is sample size because gene environmental interactions are subtle and unless it's like a linear variable like air pollution for that matter, right? It's very hard to pick up gene environmental interaction for two categorical variables. So I think this would be a useful resource for uh, picking up gene environmental interactions and uh, 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 especially at this scale because the environment is kind of the same, right? Which, so you can actually pick up significant gene environmental interactions. Great, thank you. Um, another question, Grish. Has there been progress in seamlessly integrating actionable information into EPIC for clinicians? For example, the example is eMERGE. So progress, yes. Seamless, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, clinicians are busy, right? And, you know, we need to, like, make sure that the alerts are non-interruptive and do not interrupt their workflow. Um, so right now, EMER, um, uh Kenny is running uh, the eMERGE program, which looks to integrate polygenic risk scores and give them back to clinicians and patients for uh, actionable information. Um, uh, we are trying to do that for pharmacogenomics as well, um, for certain medications like Eliquis and Warfarin in order to integrate that into uh, uh, workflow. The second way I'd like to answer that is I think the technology is there of integrating these alerts into EPIC because EPIC has a genomics module that actually works pretty well. The question is, you know, when do you integrate it? When do you interrupt the clinician's workflow for um, giving this alerts? And what's the best way to deliver this alerts to them? And all of those things have been, I think, need to be tried. The, the, the problem is that and maybe I'm going off on a rant here, is that we do a lot of things without testing them rigorously in randomized trials, right? And so we actually don't know what works rigorously. So I, this is integration of predictive tools broadly into clinical care is things that need to be tested in randomized trials. We have time for one more question. Um, and the question is, uh, do you have addresses at birth for geospatial profiling of prenatal exposures? Uh, we do have addresses. Of, we have records of, we will have records and we have records of patients who gave birth at Mount Sinai Hospital. So if that, you know, that address at birth means that, then yes. Gotcha. I'm, I'm not sure what the question meant. Okay. Uh, there's one more and we have time for that. Once one identifies a new marker for a specific disease, do you go back to stored specimens to test others with the same disease? We can. And that's why this biobanks are so useful is because you have uh, the stored specimens and linked to the clinical data. So you definitely can do that. Um, returning results for them, that's a higher bar and requires, you know, clinicians and people with genetics as well as clinical expertise to weigh in. Great. Well, Dr. Ned Carney, this was great. It was great to see your terrific work and great for you to um, bring us up to date on the Mount Sinai Million. Good luck with all your work and have a nice day, everybody. Enjoy. Thank you again. Easy. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Karish. Bye. Nice, talk. Thank nice job. Thank you.